Yeah, uh, in recent years, my uh, ministry, my career has taken some interesting tur turns. Uh, Dr. Quarles just mentioned uh, being at the Vatican Ratzinger Conference on Christology and Theology and History. That was quite an experience. There were two of us invited to give papers from North America who were Protestants. And, Stan, and, I, and I and Stan Porter uh, were those two. That was quite an honor. And we arrived and we were taken to the uh, St. Martha Hotel and we were told this is actually where the Pope lives. He didn't want to live in the palace. And my wife and I were put on the second floor, the very floor where the Pope lives. And it was very interesting to be told, now look, uh, the Holy Father is right down that hall, that's his room. You're right here, you use elevator B. At that end, he uses elevator A. So don't use his elevator and whatever you do, don't go down the hall and bang on his door. I said, okay, because you know, I'm a Protestant. They didn't know what to expect. <laughs> And I said, okay, we won't. And, uh, well, you're gonna stay for dinner tonight? And I was thinking of getting out of the Vatican City into the, into the city of Rome proper, but I was tired, jet lag and everything. I said, no, we'll go ahead and have supper here. Well, then be, on, be downstairs in the dining hall at six. So we went down in the dining hall at six and in walks the Pope. I just thought, I'm having dinner with the Pope. That was amazing. And I start getting up out of my chair and he smiles at me, no, I just stay seated. He walks by and he's wearing Nike runners, <laughs> not those little red slippers. I, this guy is different. And uh, had breakfast with him six mornings in a row, two lunches, two dinners, but who's counting? But well, what an experience to be there, well received. And it was great wandering around the city to see how the uh, clergy uh, were so loved and respected. I thought, what do you know? That's, that's good to see. And some of you will know Bernardo Estrada. He's a New Testament scholar. He's a member of Society of New Testament Studies. He was often with us wandering about in the city and warmly embraced by people, a good reputation. And I was happy to see that because we tend to hear in the news the negative stuff. And it was just good to see that actually there is another side to it. Yes, we want to talk about uh, how long uh, late antique literary manuscripts, and of course that includes scripture, which is really what we're after, we're in use. This is some new information, some new thinking in recent years that we need to take into account. We have <clears throat> created a documentary, and I want you to know about that. It's in uh, theaters April 24, uh, 741 theaters throughout the United States, and a bunch of them right here in North Carolina. Encourage people in your churches to go, including seekers, people who have been influenced negatively by Bart Ehrman and other skeptics say, oh, you know, who can trust the manuscripts? They've been changed. And so we've gone to the major cities where the oldest manuscripts are kept. We've interviewed curators, text critics, papyrologists, and others for their expert opinion. And you'll see that uh, <clears throat> it's not at all the way Professor Ehrman and his Misquoting Jesus book presented it some years ago. Anyway, this is designed to help clergy and lay people, but also scholars too who don't, ha don't have expertise in the field to understand this very important topic better. Fragments of truth about the fragments, the oldest fragments of the Greek New Testament, where they are, how good they are, what they tell us, and how we should understand the text of the New Testament. So please promote that. Uh, I think it's uh, Fathom is a ticket site, but I think you can just show up. I doubt if, you know, it'll be like a sellout, but get as many people as you can to go, April 24th. Stratigraphy and longevity. This is the focus for my talk with you today. Careful stratigraphy, and you know what that means in archaeology, basically like a layered cake, go down deeper, it's older. Obviously there are some changes sometimes, the ground can be sloped, landslides, things can get mixed up, but typically the newer is on top, you go down deeper, it gets older. And if we're careful with our stratigraphy when we unearth manuscripts in trash heaps like at Oxyrhynchus, we can learn some interesting things about longevity, how long manuscripts were in use. When I was uh, in seminary a number of years ago, well, it was the previous century, but anyway, a number of years ago, I asked my New Testament prof in a, in a class, probably a lot like some of your courses right here. It was an advanced exegesis course, and I said, Professor Sonsa, how long do you think the autographs were in use? Oh, he said, that's an interesting question. 
well, I don't know, uh, 10, 20 years. And at the time, I thought that was a very reasonable reply. I thought, okay, sure. I've got some paperback books at home, and they last 10 years, and they fall apart. Well, if he had put a zero on the end of the number, he'd have been much closer to the truth. But we just didn't know then, as you, as you will find out. <clears throat> Manuscripts recovered in situations where stratigraphy is possible. A lot of times it isn't. There is no stratigraphy at all if we simply find a manuscript that's pasted together as cartonnage, paper mache, and it's part of a mummy bodice or mask or something like that. There's no stratigraphy there. But when you find it where stratigraphy is possible, like the rubbish heaps of Oxyrhynchus, those manuscripts can be relatively dated and in some cases, absolutely dated. Manuscripts recovered along with proper stratigraphy can answer the question, how long were manuscripts in use before being discarded? This is a very important question because it goes to this whole issue of, well, if we have copies of copies of copies of copies and we have mistakes introduced every time a manuscript is copied, and no one can dispute that, it's a fact, copy of copy of copies, by the time we get to the fourth century manuscripts that we have, and you know what I'm referring to, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, where you have virtually the entire New Testament, if not the old Greek Old Testament as well, by the time you get there, by the time you get to Bezai, which dates to about 400, by the time you get on into the fifth century Alexandrinus and others, by that time, we have so many copies of copies of copies of copies, so many generations, who knows how badly altered and changed the text has, has, has uh, become because of mistakes. And if you have deliberate, theologically motivated alterations to improve what Bart Ehrman calls the orthodox corruption of scripture, then do we really know when you open up your Nestle Elan or your United Bible Society Greek New Testament, when you flip it open and turn to Romans, is that really the text that Paul dictated to Tertius the scribe? When you flip to Matthew, is that really the text that represents what Matthew the Evangelist wrote down in the first century? Or have we something else now? See, that's the issue. But if it turns out the autographs and first copies were in circulation a long, long time, that changes the equation. Because somebody writing a copy of scripture at the end of the second century, beginning of the third, does he have in front of him the autograph? Is that possible? Or a first century copy of an autograph, and it's on his table when he makes a new copy. The longer a text circulates and continues to be studied, copied, repaired, re-inked, corrected, etc., the greater its influence on the text of the writing in question. If a first century copy or the autograph itself circulates all the way until the year uh, 205 or something, it has been copied many times. And so you could have a first generation copy made in the year 200 and not just in the year 75. See, that's the point. And a whole bunch of copies in the middle. Greater longevity could bridge the time of the autographs of the first century to the time of the earliest extant witnesses, such as P45, if we're talking about the Gospels. Dates somewhere between 220 and 240, big chunks of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. When that was copied, were autographs or first century copies still circulating? Greater longevity means, in some cases, fewer generations stand between autographs and extant Manuscripts. So the old telephone game analogy begins to fall apart. Determining the age and longevity of manuscripts would aid in the study of all literatures of antiquity from classical texts to biblical texts and other related texts such as Philo, Josephus, etc. The age and longevity of our earliest biblical manuscripts could impact textual criticism in a major way. So let's consider the relevance and the evidence of Oxyrhynchus. Grenfell and Hunt, of course, they're legendary. But what I encourage you to do uh, is to read the reports. And uh, in a recent book about Oxyrhynchus, I, most, most if not all of their reports have been reprinted in a very handy way. You don't have to find a lot of these things that date to the end of the 19th century. But that particular report that uh, you see listed there on the screen, 
and especially on pages six and seven is my point of departure. Grinfell and Hunt discuss finding a basket, quite literally a basket, a wicker basket, still intact, containing several book rolls, about 20, dating perhaps to the second century, judging by the hand. But <clears throat> where did they find it? Well, they, on this occasion, they happened to be paying close attention to the uh, stratigraphy, and the layer in which they found it was judged to be either 4th or 5th century AD. So think about that for a moment. Um, Second century scrolls found in a fourth or fifth century layer of ground. That means these scrolls were in use till discarded two to 300 years. That's significant. And of course, we're not talking about um, archives. We're not talking about business papers. We're talking about literature here. Now, of course, literature is always notorious because literature is rarely dated. Archival materials, documents, or what's called documentary papyri, they often are dated because they're personal letters, they're business papers, they're contracts, they're government papers, things like that. They almost always have, you know, the third year of emperor somebody. They have dates, but literature almost never does. And so we, we rely on paleography, that is dating according to the style of handwriting. Anyway, there are uh, Grenfell and Hunt, and they began their excavations at Oxyrhynchus in uh, the late 1890s, 96, 97. That's where they were. These are some old black and white photos. Now, you can see this trench. The man in the center, two men in the center, are standing in a trench. They're digging down into the trench. That's what gives us the possibility of stratigraphy. But uh, uh, Grenfell and Hunt often were supervising 100 diggers at once, digging in a bunch of places. It was very hard to maintain that. And these, these uh, bulks, as we would call them in archaeology, as they get higher and higher, they just collapse. And the diggers didn't care. They were just recovering. They were paid on papyri. They recovered and put in their own baskets. By the way, there was destruction. There was looting. Uh, they discovered that uh, these goofy Europeans would be willing to pay money, bakshish, for this worthless, old, rotting brown paper. And so they would steal it, smuggle it out, sell it on the antiquities market. And so a lot of unprovenanced papyri that began to circulate in the early 20th century likely came from Oxyrhynchus. Again, you can see the trench. You can see them gathering up uh, fragments of papyrus, placing the ba baskets. Uh, we have several hundred thousand uh, pages, it's estimated, about half a million pages of papyrus from Oxyrhynchus alone. Only about 10% of it's published. See, so that's why from time to time you hear a big surprise about something that's published in the Oxyrhynchus series, and that's why. We'll, that we'll be hearing surprises for years and years and years to come. So the stratigraphy, unfortunately, was for the most part weak, if there was any at all. It tended to be sporadic and imprecise. Mounds were identified, though sometimes vaguely, Workers recovered materials and placed them in baskets. Papyrus was stolen and ended up on the antiquities market, and supervision of the work was often less than ideal, such as sometimes Grenfell or uh, Hunt alone supervising as many as 100 workers. You can imagine what that was like. I'm not criticizing them for that. We, I don't think it's fair to take our archaeological uh, techniques and expectations and apply them to 125 years ago and then criticize them for not doing what we do today. But uh, a lot of these mounds cannot even be identified. I mean, think of how it's done now. I've been working uh, mostly in recent years at Mount Zion. Uh, Shimon Gibson is the uh, lead archaeologist there. And we do GPS coordinates. So where some, something is found, we know within like a foot, give or take a foot, where it was found. We do elevations. We know exactly the level. You know, that kind of, that's just standard. That's why they only dig four, five, six weeks each year and then spend the rest of the year cataloging and assessing what's been unearthed. Thousands of fragments of pottery, pieces of glass, maybe a hundred coins, other objects that are found. And this goes on year after year. And finally, they have to just stop and then <clears throat> write up everything that's been found. And that's the way it is at our dig and that's the way it is at all the other digs. Well, Grenfell and Hunt were not there to do archeology. span They were there to recover manuscripts. And so the uh, stratigraphy was just an afterthought, and that's part of the problem. <clears throat> On the problem of imprecise stratigraphy, an almost complete lack of what would pass today as archaeology and the recovery of papyri fox rhynchus, you can see some essays 
particularly that first one in Roger Bagnall's Oxford Handbook of Papyrology. And you can get, read up on that and see what I'm talking about. Nevertheless, as poor as the archaeology and stratigraphy were, we have acquired significant information about the longevity of manuscripts. So it's an exciting new area of study just in the last few years. It got underway by uh, George uh, Houston, who's at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's now retired, a classist in a publication that came out in 2009. I became aware of it, began corresponding with him. He's published more since then, and I've entered the fray as well. Anyway, there is important evidence about longevity of ancient literary manuscripts, including biblical literature. And so <clears throat> we have, uh, there's new consideration of old evidence, such as the archives, and comments made by ancient authors you'll find intriguing, because they used to be dismissed. It's like, well, they can't, that can't be right. He doesn't know what he's talking about, that kind of stuff. Now we look at it and say, I think they did know what they were talking about. And the whole idea of libraries, finding an entire library intact, up to 1,000 uh, uh, literary documents or 2,000 uh, documents or something like that. Now, the archives are interesting. They're not that much to the point, but it's worth mentioning in passing. The archive of the family of Philosorapus spans some 135 years. Now, that's a long archive. Most archives don't exceed a century. The well-known Xenon archive, numbering some 2,000 documents, and it's an archive, so we're not talking literature, we're talking business papers. Anyway, ranges in date from as early as 261 to 229 BC. The archive of Phanesis, a seller of oil, that archive ranges in date from about 233 to 223, so that's just 10, 11 years. The temple archive of Sokon Brasis in the Fayum, who's uh, his uh, papers span some 80 years. That's a little on the long side. The archive of Heronius, Her uh, sorry, Heroninus, numbers about 450 documents that range from 253 to 306. So that gives you an idea of typical Greco-Roman uh, archives in our period of time, reaching back perhaps to post-Alexander the Great on into the first century. <coughs> From the Judean desert, we also have the Babatha archive comprising 35 legal documents, 26 Greek, 6 Nabataeans, 3 in Aramaic, ranging in date from 93 or 4 uh, AD to 132 uh, AD. And that archive likely would have continued on had they not died in the Bar Kokhba rebellion. <clears throat> In most cases, the longevity of archival documents is not great. This is especially so in reference to business and legal papers. The papers found in the archives of Phanesis, Xenon, and Babatha date over periods of 10 or 11, 31 or 32, and 38 or 39 years, respectively. The family archives of Patron and Philosorapus exhibit much greater longevity. <clears throat> we may speculate that business and legal archives were in active use for shorter periods of time simply because contracts expired, legal matters were concluded, either in court or in death. Family archives may have remained in use for much longer periods of time because sentimental value was attached to the documents. The longevity of the temple archive of Socombrasis may have been due in part to the religious nature of some of the documents and the value placed on them. In contrast to business and legal papers, including family papers, literary documents enjoyed much greater longevity. They did not expire or become obsolete. Now here's some of the literary evidence for that, and this I think you'll find fascinating. It has in the past been brushed off, but let's take a new look at it in light of the, the mounting evidence. First century Pliny the Elder claims to have seen autographs of some of the Gracchi letters the Gracchi uh, people with legal opinions, social and, and, and political ideas and so on, were very famous. Well, in his time, they would have been about 200 years old. Now, he said autographs, not copies, the autographs of their letters. And, of course, as an ancient writer, he'd know what an autograph looks like. Um, and it's the professional scribe writes in a neat, practiced hand. And then the pen is handed to the dictator, the person dictating the letter, the true author of the letter, and the author of the letter picks up the pen <clears throat> and usually in a very clumsy, unpracticed hand with larger letters, writes out his own name, maybe says greetings to you or I pray for you or I look forward to seeing you and then signs his name. <clears throat> so this is an intelligent man who writes natural history and everything else. He knows what he's talking about. 
And he says he saw autographs in the plural of some of these Gracchi letters. Well, when he's writing this, and the, the letters, when they were pinned, about 150 BC or so, would mean that, that uh, the longevity is about 200 years. There's more. Late second century, Galen tells us that some also had desired to find very old volumes, not necessarily uh, autographs in this case, very old volumes written 300 years ago, which I had, he says. So this is not some rumor about somebody else. Galen himself is saying this. I had at Pergamum, <clears throat> of which were preserved in scrolls, part on papyrus, part on excellent lime tree bark, and so on. And by the way, lime tree bark letters, and they're really brief. They're usually just a dip titch writing on, on two sides. Inside, it's folded. We've found over uh, 900 of those in Britain that date to the Roman period. In this particular case, we have a longevity of at least 300 years. Plutarch relates the story of the discovery at, at, at Skepsis of a number of manuscripts of Aristotle, which were then seized by Sulla about 86 BC and taken to Rome. If this story is factual, and of course this is second and third hand, so you know we have to be a little careful with it, then the papyrus manuscripts in question would have been about 250 years old. A similar, <clears throat> similar longevity has been observed at Qumran, where the life of this community's library, as a consequence of the Jewish revolt, came to an abrupt end either in 68 or 73. Those are the two dates that scholars debate over when Qumran was destroyed by the Romans. Most of the scrolls were 100 to 150 years old when the community ceased to exist. So longevity of 100 to 150 years. However, approximately 40 scrolls, many of them Bible scrolls, there were some 220 Bible scrolls at Qumran. Well, about 40 of them, about one-fifth or so, were 200 to 300 years old and evidently still in use when the community was destroyed. Well, I think this is very relevant because Christianity, of course, grows and springs up out of the uh, Jewish soil. And so here are these Bible scrolls still in use, a few of them like the Leviticus scroll. The Leviticus scroll, by the way, uh, from cave four dates to 300 BC, we think. Well, that, that puts it over 350 years old, still being read and studied when Qumran came to a sudden and violent end. George Houston, professor of classics at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, now retired, has reopened the evidence of the longevity of literary manuscripts on the basis of stratigraphy and other methods of determining dates. He cites five libraries recovered from Oxyrhynchus and one library recovered from the Villa of Papyri at Herculaneum. Here is uh, some of his work. That's uh, two, 2007, so it's been 11 years. That's what got it started. He started reading Grenfell and Hunt's reports, including Italian scholar Brescia and his reports later on in the 20th century. And he said, you know what? There's some very interesting evidence of longevity of literature. Then he published something uh, in uh, William Johnson, Holt Parker's book, Ancient Literacies. And then very recently, just, uh, well, now four years ago, Inside Roman Libraries, and I commend that book to you. You want to see those pages mentioned there where he tabulates things and talks about how long uh, manuscripts were in use in the six uh, libraries where we actually have chronological information. 53, now this is the sad part, 53 libraries were recovered at Oxyrhynchus. We have stratigraphy information, chronological information on only five. So not quite even one in 10. And that was the lost opportunity. And as they, any archeologist will tell you, when you uh, uh, do archeology, span you get one kick at the can. When you dug everything up, you can't decide to redig it. Well, I didn't do it right, let's do it again. It's done. And so if the stratigraphy is botched, lost, nothing much you can do about it. So what has, <clears throat> <clears throat> what has George Houston learned regarding longevity of the manuscripts? Well, he has found that literary manuscripts, and again, it's literary manuscripts, it's not business papers, contracts, literature, people that, things that people read for pleasure, for education. <clears throat> they were in use in a range of 150. He did find a few that were a little younger than that, but most of them in that 150 to 500 years and the majority in the 150 to 250 year range. That is really amazing, okay? So the question is, did Christians value their literature 
as much as the pagans valued theirs. Thing. Applied to the New Testament manuscripts, this suggests that some of the autographs and first copies could still have been in use as late as the third century. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. So if we just go with 150, the shorter end of the average, instead of 200 or 250, <clears throat> autographs, say, written in the year 50 through 75, New Testament autographs, 50 to 75, Gospel of John probably later, like 90, tack on 50, 150 years, and that takes them all the way to 200, that 200 to 225 range. Well, that's where things that you see at the bottom of the slide, P45, Gospels and Acts, P46, Paul's letters, P66, the whole Gospel of John, P72, uh, uh, Luke and John, or, or just Luke, and P75, Luke and John. Most of these, I know P75 recently by Brent Nongbri has been challenged, but most of these, everybody would agree, are in that 200 to 250 range. And there's a possibility that when these were written, the autographs are still circulating and still being copied. And so whoever wrote these uh, manuscripts, these copies of scripture, they're not necessarily using a 10th generation or 15th generation or 20th generation removed from the originals, but could be, I'm not claiming that any of them had an autograph in front of him, but could be using uh, copies, uh, two copies, one copy, two, maybe three, comparing them, who knows, that uh, are only second, third generation and not 15 or 20 generations. Now, do we actually have direct evidence for the great longevity of the autographs, actually we do. <clears throat> Tertullian, writing about the year 190, talks about autographs still available in several cities. Peter Bishop of Alexandria, who died in 311 some years earlier in a homily, Easter homily, stated the autograph copy itself of the evangelist John, which up to this day has by divine grace been preserved in the most holy church of Ephesus and is there adored by the faithful. <clears throat> If we date John to uh, 90, and we date the homily to 290 or 290s, John's autograph is 200 years old. Now, my interpretation of this statement by Peter, the Bishop of Alexandria, is not it's divine grace that the book lasted so long, as though, wow, papyri normally falls apart. No, it hasn't been confiscated and destroyed by enemies of the church. I think that's his point. That's the divine grace. It, the, the text has been protected by, by human destructive efforts, not, wow, against all odds, somehow this thing is still legible. That's not his point. Now, let me, uh, in some detail, look at Tertullian. Tertullian is writing uh, something called Prescription Against Heresies. It's chapter 36, first two verses. He says this, come now, you who would indulge a better curiosity. If you would apply it to the business of your salvation, run over the apostolic churches in which the very thrones of the apostles are still preeminent in their places, in which their own authentic writings, do a little Latin study here, ipsi authentici literae orum, are read, uttering the voice and representing the face of each of them severally. Now, <clears throat> this is the translation by uh, uh, Peter Holmes in 1880, by the way, and it's in the Anti-Nicene Fathers. Now notice this, how he translates or does not translate, really. He says authentic writings. Well, authentic is nothing more than an English transliteration of authentici. So what does that authentic mean? We'll see that in a minute. Greece is near you, in which you find Corinth. You are not far from Macedonia. You have Philippi, and there too you have the Thessalonians. Since you are able to cross to Asia, you get... Ephesus, since moreover you are close to Italy, you have Rome, from which there comes even into our own hands the very authority of the apostles themselves is what he means. So anyway, there you have it. Now we have seven letters mentioned here in five locations. So what does authentici, the uh, it's feminine plural to agree with the letters, feminine plural, according to the Oxford Dictionary of Latin, authenticum, that adjective, means autograph. Peter Holmes did not translate it autographs. He translated authentic writings. The authentici literae mean letter autographs. Now, the anti Nicene tr uh, translator in 1880, Peter Holmes, was reluctant to translate uh, 
authentici literae as letter autographs because he couldn't imagine the autographs surviving for more than a century. In his time, papyrus was a brand new thing, and it was believed that it was a fragile medium and could not possibly survive a hundred plus years. Okay, of course now we have evidence that suggests otherwise, but he, I can't blame him. He did not know that. So that's why he does not translate, but transliterates. On into the 20th century, the myth of the fragility of papyrus persisted, to which the great papyrologist T.C. Skeet responded in this essay, Early Christian Book Production, Papyri Manuscripts, in 1969. I wish he'd actually written it as a separate article because it gets lost in the Cambridge History of the Bible, but this is an important um, essay, and in there he talks about this myth that papyrus is not durable but fragile. He said, are you kidding? Just, just stop and think about it. We find uh, papyri in the dump at Oxyrhynchus, and it's intact, legible, and still in pretty good shape as long as it didn't get too wet, dug down too deep in the moist sand, but up closer to the top. And some of this stuff is 22, 2300 years old and is preserved and, and legible. Uh, how's, it, how's it fragile? That, that's silly. So the implications of Tertullian, just to tease it out, Romans written, we think, about 57 A.D., Philippians about 63. Tertullian wrote in 190, therefore the autograph of Romans would have been 133 years old. The autograph of Philippians would have been 127 years old, well within the longevity spans noted in the ancient literature and in the evidence of the excavations, as pointed out, uh, by uh, George Houston. <clears throat> now there's additional evidence. Early Christian Bibles such as Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus were re-inked for continued reading 500 years or more after they were originally produced. <clears throat> Codex Vaticanus was re-inked in the 10th century. Missing leaves were added in the 15th century. Correctors worked on Codex Sinaiticus as late as the 7th century. The Codex was annotated by a monk named Dionysus in the 12th century, 5th century, early 5th century, late 4th. Codex Bezi was repaired between 830 and 850. Many other biblical codices show signs of re-inking, correcting, repair, and annotations hundreds of years after they were produced. The manuscripts were in use a long, long time. Were Christian scribes unique? I'll skip over these quotations by Harry Gamble, but he says, no, they're not. They were very much part of the scribal book question of their time. Okay, and so Gamble's books and readers in uh, uh, late uh, antiquity. I should add to that uh, the more recent dissertation by Alan Mugridge, uh, I reviewed his book in the Bulletin for Biblical Research. He concludes that the majority of the early scribes, that is in the first, <clears throat> second, and on into the third century, were professional scribes, many of them not Christian. Now think of the implication of that. Professional scribes who are paid line by line. They're not paid to innovate, edit, improve, update. They have no theological dog in the fight. So why are they going to corrupt the text and move it in an orthodox direction? What do they care? And some of their uh, scribal mistakes are mindless where it's clear they're not really tracking or following uh, what, they're, what they are reading. In other, words, in other words, they're not reading what they're co uh, copying. That's an interesting observation and this yanks the rug out from under Bart Ehrman's skepticism and his point about Orthodox corruption of scripture. Now, did, were there textual variants motivated by theology? Well, of course, I'm not saying there weren't. But the problem was not, uh, it really wasn't problematic and widespread as some have assumed. So what are the implications for textual criticism? Then I'll stop and give you an opportunity to ask some questions. If autographs and first century copies survived 150 years or more, if our earliest extant substantial papyri, such as P45, P46, P47, P66, and P75, survived, let us say, very modestly, let us say, in use for 100 years, in other words, from 220 to 240 until 320 to 340, we then have a bridge linking the autographs to the great codices in which the Greek text of the New Testament is extant in its entirety. This does not mean that the autographic text 
is preserved in the great codices, but it does help explain how well stabilized the text of the Greek New Testament is. In contrast, for example, to the second through fourth century Gnostic books, there are thousands of variants, but the vast majority are quite minor and, and have no bearing on anything. The text of the Greek New Testament is quite stable, and we could, if we had time, talk about some of these other Gnostic writings whose texts, uh, if you have two copies or more of any Gnostic text, they are all, you can't even begin to imagine what the original text looked like. And that's acknowledged, for example, by Fred Wissey of Yale, well-known um, uh, uh, expert on Gnostic texts, the Secret Book of John, for example. So one of the reasons for the stability of the text of the New Testament manuscripts, I believe, was the great longevity and how they were treated as precious, great longevity of the autographs and first copies. Their longevity guarded against corruption and free rewriting of the text, as seen, for example, in the Gnostic text. I'll stop now.